Okay, welcome uh, everybody to um, our latest um, discussion in as part uh, of um, a series uh, of conversations uh, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the new perspectives uh, in translation and interpreting uh, studies uh, with uh, Routledge. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, pleased uh, today to have the two authors uh, of uh, translation and uh, trans languaging, um, <clears throat> a volume that is, as, as editor of the series, um, I was very uh, happy to publish because of um, the so many different and interesting perspectives that it brought to bear uh, on our thinking uh, in, in translation. So just a word or two about uh, uh, Mike and uh, Tonking uh, Lee. Uh, so Mike Bainham is uh, Emeritus Professor of TESOL at the University of Leeds. Um, he's a background in sociolinguistics and uh, applied linguistics and has written widely on the subject uh, of multilingualism and language in uh, migration. Um, in more recent years, although he, he told me just before we came on air, that this is reactivating uh, an old uh, older interest of his, he has become very active in the area of, of poetry uh, translation um, and has worked with uh, people like the Moroccan poet, um, Abdullah uh, Zriki, um, and uh, also um, a Moroccan uh, Sajal uh, poet, uh, Adel uh, Latri. Um, and he's also uh, working on uh, translations of the Kurdish Syrian uh, poet, uh, Jagir Ilo. So this is, uh, Mike is obviously somebody who br brings a, uh, not only a great deal of conceptual sophistication to how we understand translation, but also a great deal of uh, practical lived experience of the, the translator's uh, art. Uh, Talking uh, Lee um, is Associate Professor uh, of uh, Translation at the University of Hong Kong and Honorary Professor of the University, University College London. Um, he is the author uh, of Kongish, um, or which I think is due for publication, or has just been published by Cambridge University Press, uh, Choreographies of Multilingualism, uh, Oxford University Press, uh, 2022, and Translation as Experimentalism, uh, Cambridge University uh, Press 2022. So uh, obviously this is something of an annus mirabilis uh, for you, uh, TK, because uh, all these volumes coming out so close to uh, each other. So we're, we're delighted to have you part of this conversation today. So basically the question that I wanted to uh, begin with um, is a kind of an origin uh, question. Um, what made both of you want to work with each other uh, on this particular uh, topic? What was the, 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 the genesis of, of this particular uh, idea? Um, Mike, if I can. If I could start here, Michael. Well, originally you invited me to do, to contribute a book on translation and translanguaging. And to be honest, at my stage of life, I, I realized that probably if I'd agreed it would never have happened, I needed a collaborator. I just read Translating the Multilingual City by TK, which had really fascinated me and impressed me. And we, we'd started talking. So I said, would you be interested? And what, what was your reaction, TK? Um, so I think I think we knew each other before before the invitation, shortly. Yeah. yeah. And at that time. Mike was involved in the AHRC project, Translation and Translanguaging. So this, this book became very timely. Um, Mike probably thought that he needed someone from translation studies proper. <laughs> um, to, it had to, to be not anybody, it had to be somebody who really connected and I felt your work. Right. So because this this book is about the interface between translation and translanguaging, which is really ex exploratory because um, nobody knew what that was, including ourselves. We really learned as we as we wrote. Um, so I think it's a it's a there's some creative um, tension and productivity between between the two of us. Um, with um, myself contributing from the perspective of translation, although not really um, the conventional 
the conventional within the conventional scope and um, with uh, Mike drawing his data from the HRC project. So I think um, I think that's um, that's one that's how the book is structured and how it came about. And it was a fun book to write. It was it was perhaps less fun to edit for publication, but actually once it, it was great, it was great fun to put it together because it was very very exploratory for both of us. And we were having to ask ourselves questions all the time about like, what is the relationship between translation and translanguaging? It might seem obvious, but it's not obvious once you start kind of looking into it. Yeah, and I wanted to sort of, you know, uh, maybe um, move in a little on, on that particular notion then, which is you know, key to the, uh, the title. A lot of people uh, will assume that they know what translation is, even if these are false assumptions, but, um, but in the case of uh, translanguaging itself, I mean, what would you say were your uh, understandings of what constituted translanguaging? And did these notions change or evolve through the conversations that you had with each other? Okay, well, I could start. Mike, you go first. I mean, Trans translanguaging, I described it in the book at one point, I noticed as a new kid on the block. So it's a kind of relatively new construct. Um, the more traditional one in sociolinguistics is code switching. So the, I would think of translanguaging as a sort of a shift of emphasis rather than a, than a paradigm shift. In other words, it's the focus is on the speaker, the multilingual or bilingual speaker who and the repertoire of the speaker. So it's the, the, it's it's how language coexists and interplays with it with itself so in the in the repertoire of, of speakers. Um, and as, there's more I could say on repertoire, but maybe I'd let that sort of talk TK come in here. And... Um, for me, I think <clears throat> from my perspective, I think what translanguaging can can tell translation is through the case studies, especially the um, the data from the data the data from the HRC project is that translation is not always undertaken as translating per se. It's interweaved with other discursive activities across languages and cultures. It could be transliteration, code switching, it could be gist translation, it could be elaboration and so on. So many of the case studies in the first part of the book um, exemplify that is that translation is just a, a, a part of the bigger picture. So we could probably see translanguaging as the as the broader um, as the broader umbrella um, uh, encapsulating discursive processes including translation. But on the other hand, we could also, um, think of translation more translationally, as in um, to extend the ambit. I think the challenge for translanguaging for translation is how far translation can extend its ambit. Um, how 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 translation can include translation in the conventional sense as well as the translational translational um, activities, including uh, which is actually which is translanguaging. And that will include all kinds of um, all kinds of interface between different res resources from different languages, as well as non linguistic modalities. So is there a sense in which what we're basically trying to do was that, you know, we tend to think of translation as um, the sort of text, 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 context uh, operations. But uh, what you were trying to argue that in fact, when people engage in translation, um, that there's a whole series of uh, different elements, which may be um, varieties uh, of the, the language, uh, physical, bodily uh, cues, um, uh, elements that are to do with the kind of spatial arrangement of the place in which the the, the, the translators and the translators find themselves is it, is it, is that sense of sort of um, 
looking at the moments of translation and, and, and sort of uh, and parsing the different elements that go into that translational moment is, 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 is that is that uh, what you were, if you like, trying to, to demonstrate or show? I think that's right on the point, because at one point in the book, we did, um, we did come up with this, um, with this conception of, of translation and translanguaging as different axes. So if translation is from, is the movement, the linear movement from point A to point B, that's a horizontal axis. Then translanguaging, as um, Michael has said just now, is the tiny moments along this trajectory that goes downwards, that points vertically downwards into within the conversation, within this moment, what is what is happening is actually very messy. Um, and it's nothing, nothing, nothing linear. So I think I think that is how we. Is that right, Mike? That's how we conceptualized it at one point. Absolutely. So, so the it's a shift. I mean, going back to what you were saying, Michael, about you know the language one, language two, source language, target language. This is all a bit like code switching. It's sort of the codes. It, it, it's kind of on the level of language system code. And I think what we're shifting toward, we shifted towards, is a focus on, as it were, the speaker or the writer, the the the, the person. Who's who's kind of animating all this, um, and it's, it's it's quite a in sociolinguistics, which is really kind of my field. It's a real really interesting move. Suddenly we're we're into the speaker, and if you're into the speaker, you're also into language creativity. So there's a big interest now within sociolinguistics about creativity in language, and that again connects with the kind of work that TK is doing. And I think you're in your more recent work, you're bringing this into studies of multilingualism, there's a, the dimension of aesthetics and play is really valuable. So it's a really interesting moment. And I think that that's what we were trying to kind of work work on in the book. I mean, was there something which was a term they use at one point, I mean, about kind of separate bilingualism? I mean, this kind of notion that, that so we have the monolingual, but then what we have the, bi, the bilingual is Basically, kind of parallel monolingualisms. Yeah, um, and yeah. That, that what you're that by is by by emphasising the role of the the, the speaker um, that it, it you begin to look at what are all of these things that then converge uh, on the uh, on 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 the speaker on 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 the translator and that that, that the translator is in, in inhabited by. A, um, a repertoire of, of 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 different languages and registers. Mm. Things is that, that that that's. But but also language ideologies because I mean you talked about sort of an ideology of monolingualism but also of separate bilingualism, and I think we're we're very inhabited by. I mean even myself I realised over the period of writing this book I mean I speak French and I would sort of have a kind of culture of not using English words, even if I was stuck for the word in French. So I'd kind of avoid saying something rather than use English. And through this kind of confronting these kind of ideologies in writing the book, I just realized, hang on, if the word comes in English, it comes in English, you know? Um, so it's a sort of a shifting of perspective, but there are language ideologies, which are quite, you know, quite sort of pervasive and strong influences on the actual speaker. Mm. And, and I want to add that um, apart from languages and language varieties and registers, we're also interested in translanguaging is also interested in the materialities of the space in which um, communication takes place, as well as the platforms on which the materiality of the platforms, the affordances um, that certain platforms um, offer up to the interlocutors in a, in a communicative event. So that is one very important aspect of translanguaging, uh, which is the transgression of the boundary between what we see as verbal and nonverbal modalities. Um, could, you, could you say a bit more about the, the, the materialities question? I mean, um, but could you give us you know, uh, one or two examples from, from, from the book of how the, the materialities you're talking about uh, inflect or in, impinge 
uh, the the translation. translation. I think the most <laughs> I'll, I'll draw from my my contributions to the book, which is as aesthetic literary data. So I'm looking at things like in art installations, which is obviously not the typical kind of sociolinguistic data that um, <clears throat> we're used to. So we are looking at how how the kind of material or chosen by the by the artist influences how the reader or viewer perceives the text. For example, so this here the idea of embodiment comes in. So reading, the reading, reading is not just reading, it's about, it's about, it's a, it engages a full body, it's a full body in, involvement, for example, certain kinds, the, the way in which a, an installation is laid can influence how, whether the reader can um, read whatever is on the installation on eye level or whether the reader has to bend down in order to, to read or squat down in order to read it. All of this is part of reading um, and it's part of the, is part of the materiality of circumstances surrounding a, surrounding a text. So we're really, we're really not talking about um, text and communication in, um, in a very limited sense, we're really expanding it to include uh, not just text, not just language languages, but also the circums the material circumstances surrounding the communicative event, which will impinge on how the reader or viewer or the speaker perceives the communicative event. Mm. I mean, that is very interesting. I, I is the way in which you you in the book you contest. Um, two images, I think, you know, fairly standard images of, of translation. Um, and one is the notion of translation as a kind of an oscillation where you're constantly going from text A to text B and from language A to language B, or sort of this backwards and forwards uh, uh, movement. Um, and the second is the notion that basically translation inhabits border spaces, you know, that, that you've, you've got these kind of monolingual monoliths uh, and then the, the the points where they 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 they, they touch um, this is where we get our kind of uh, translation zone uh, and I think that what you're arguing that in in, in both cases that um, that really uh, tr translation is is always al already there that that the person who is oscillating going is already in a state of, of translation before they even begin that that journey but also that there, there is no such thing as as monolingual heartlands that they're they're always already in a state of, of translation is, is is that a fair summation of your your, your challenge in the book to those uh, particularly I think the border notion is a, is a very strong one in, in translation thinking if I could come in here um... The, the sort of, as it were, the accepted idea in linguistics is the, is the speech community, which is the, 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 the shared notions and values of speaking, which what, what, what Mary Louise Pratt sort of pushed aside was the notion, this notion of similarity and, and the idea of borders, of speaking across boundaries. And I think that's very, very important for us. And it's also echoed, there's a very interesting book by Ms. Adra Nielsen on borders as well, which... I kind of drew on when I was writing, re I was reading it and was when I was writing the book. So in a way, we're always communicating across boundaries, even within the so-called nation state. Um, and to me, that's a very productive idea because it makes me think that maybe translation is actually a better metaphor than for communication than the shared communication, that we're, all, we're continually talking across boundaries. Um, to, so to me, it's a, it's a very generative or powerful notion. I think Michael has um, summed up the one of the, one of our arguments quite well, which is that, as as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to take in the writing in the course of writing this book, I was trying to take translation inward, which means I'm trying to move away from the idea that translation fills up the space or bridges that space, irreconcilable space between two 
um, discrete entities to look at how translation is always already inherent in the entity itself. It could be the person's repertoire, or in the second part of the book, it could be within a piece of an inter a translingual piece of art. So when I'm in, we're not so interested there in how the piece of art is being translated from language to language, um, as in how translation becomes a method in the constitution of the text or the piece of art, art itself. Is there a sense in which one of the consequences of your work in translation and translanguaging is to kind of um, rehabilitate what is often seen as the sort of the poor cousin of translation or the Cinderella, which is uh, intralingual translation? Because one of your, your, your arguments, if I found, understood the book correctly, is that translation is fundamentally to do with this this management of difference. This this is you know, uh, it's not some kind of as you say kind of transparent, clear line of, of communication such as this speech community idea. But it's it's always this endless negotiation of, of difference. So is there a sense in which that that, that kind of Jacobsonian intralingual translation? You know, in, in you know back in, in 1915, he he was trying to get at something in, around this. This was this kind of came out of the translanguaging project. And we were, were, it was very much empirically driven. It wasn't like a theoretical sort of move. So we were working with data, which seemed to me to go well beyond the, um, purely the engagement of two languages. So there were kind of other kinds of language varieties going in play. And so I thought about the, you know, this framework of Jacobs and the interlingual, the intralingual and the, and the, and the, the semiotic, you know, the, the and, um, transpose that to think of translanguaging in that way. And there was so much data in our data, so much on the intersemiotic, on the, inter, you know, there was so much data that it, and then we started trying to extend it, for example, into the embodied, the notion of embodiment. So we were working with things, um, one aspect of the project, we were looking at capoeira and um, basketball. And obviously, if you're looking at sports, the modes of communication are not verbal. I mean, there's, the body speaks, you know, in the way that, that sort of um, Judith Butler talks about the body speaking. So that that was the shift, particular, you know, in, in the translanguaging side of it. And I think TK then takes it into, tra into translation in very interesting ways too. Um, one of the images that's used at one point to try and think about, you know, this where, translation and translanguaging might uh, converge um, is, is, is the notion of self-translation and, and, and self-translation has be become a kind of important research area in translation studies in, in, in recent years and I was wondering you know was there a sense in which the, the, the notion of the self-translator the, 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 the author as translator the translator as author that that was that a useful way of thinking about translanguaging, about the, the, the kind of the, the repertoire converging uh, on the person rather than all of these things being out there in discrete areas? Um, so, TK, if you want. I to think we that. mentioned that, I remember we mentioned that in the introduction, if I'm not wrong, um, about, about how the self translator exemplifies. Um, the multilingual individual who has you know, not just discrete parcels of um, language in his within his uh, as a, as part of his linguistic proficiency, but a whole repertoire that includes resources from different um, languages as and maybe non linguistic modalities as well. Uh, why the self translator? Because within self translation, there is a lot of um, negotiations going on. It's not just text to text, language to language, because the writer sometimes may change his original text, his the text that came before, and um, so the this this uh, negotiation process to us is um, analogical, I would say, to translanguaging. So the, the self translator to the translator is like translanguaging 
to translation. Something along this line. We were exploring something along this line, but uh, remember it's in the introductions. So it's part of the, our introduction is dialogic and therefore it's part of the brainstorming kind of, um, kind of work. And we have, we don't have um, a firm answer on this point. Mike, do you want to jump in? Look, I've sort of engaged, I suppose, in self translation practic practically. One of the interesting things about it, if you're translating your own piece of work, you, you don't have to consider, you know, if you've, if sometimes you can translate something and then you think, oh, that's much better than the original. So you didn't go and change the original. And clearly you can't go and change the original if it's somebody else's work. So, so to me, it's a very interesting, we've talked about spaces of play. It's a wonderful space of play to be able to move between languages in that way. Did you sense, you know, when, um, you know, obviously, you know, you, you were coming at this project from, from different backgrounds, TK more for translation studies, um, Mike from kind of linguistic uh, ethnography and, and that, but I, I just wonder in terms of, you know, situating this book and the, the kind of the translation studies uh, constellation, um, where, I mean, to put it rather crudely, we, we could say that there was a big influence of linguistics uh, on uh translation studies at a particular moment you know whether it was chomsky in linguistics or, or later kind of structuralist linguistics but with the, you know what's called the, the cultural turn and the 80s kind of a, a, a turn and move away uh from uh linguistics um i, I think it was some point in the, the book used the word disdain um and um that because it was part of this thing to to try and move a translation studies from over the under the shadow of a particular version instrumentalist version of applied linguistics um but is there a sense in you know in in um what you're 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 doing this work is that it's it's to try and um bring the <laughs> the, the the two entities back into into communication again that that um given the, the work that's um because of, of course, there's a certain amount of interface around corpus linguistics, around critical discourse uh, analysis. Um, but I think in, in bringing in, you know, elements of linguistic ethnography, linguistic anthropology, uh, particular areas of sociolinguistics, um, that you're trying to sort of um, suggest maybe to the translation studies community um, that they need to think again about, you know, what is happening in linguistics but conversely um for the linguistics uh community maybe they need to read more deeply what's been happening in uh translation studies in the last uh 20 years or so because i was struck recently i read a book by Anne stiva um 2015 work on, on eco linguistics um or uh, alistair pennacooks and um uh, Suji's book on, on metrolingualism um, and there are translation issues everywhere in those books but there's no mention of translation <laughs> so it, is there a kind of you know what uh, Pierre Trudeau once said about the French and English speaking communities in Canada it was the coexistence of two solitudes I mean is there a sense <laughs> in which linguistics and translation studies are you know, um, need to engage in, in, in the dialogue that, that, that you're suggesting in the book? I think I, I certainly feel this because uh, in recent, in the recent five to six years, I've been moving my research slowly towards sociolinguistics. So I'm like, I'm like um, the person embodying the translanguaging. So I find that in sociolinguistics, translation is not a prominent theme, although it gets it gets um wrapped into multilingualism so it gets like um penny cook's work for instance you said translation is everywhere as as when i read this book i read translation in everywhere but, but it doesn't really come up as a as a theme so it's it's usually cor a corollary of multilingualism so and conversely translation study scholars have engaged with sociology for quite some time in the Bodusian tradition, but not with sociolinguistics, sociolinguistic concepts. But no, 
we're all talking about language and society. It's all about language society. So it's, um, I think it's, it's very productive to, to, to look at how, when we, when these two fields interface, what kind of, whether we are still able to find new objects of inquiry. Yeah, it's, it's not quite settled yet, even, you know, though we have finished the book, I think the relation might well agree that the relationship between translation and translanguaging is, is not settled. Provisional, it's still, isn't it? Provisional. Yes. Right. We don't have the final answer. We have a we have we have an intervention to make, but we don't we don't there is no um settled answer yet. So Mike. Um in a way, I think what happens from I'm picking up from what Michael Michael's original kind of framing is that fields can get out of sync and there's, there's a need to catch up. There's probably a need to catch up with translation theory. I can see what the moment where translation theory left linguistics, but also people like myself who work in kind of linguistic ethnography, as TK points out, we're extremely interested in the interface between language phenomena and the social, the shaping social phenomena, and that is the real driving force. So, you know, I find Judith Butler as useful for me in my work as a particular specific linguist, and she's not obviously not a linguist. So it's kind of deploying the sort of the these theoretical frameworks in a kind of productive way, which, um, so it's really, and if I would say a word for linguistic analysis, it, it kind of ties you into the text in a way. Very often, I think social theory, you get the big picture, but how does it actually play out in actual scenarios? So the, the linguistic focus brings you into the interaction with whatever the interaction is. So to me, that's the value, that's what keeps me there. If, if I could just stay with that point for a moment, uh, Mike, and, um, you know, you, there's a kind of a bipartite structure in, in, in the book where I, so I suppose one could, one could argue that, you know, uh, the first part of the book is, is largely to do with maybe uh, ethnographic uh, uh, data and social settings and seeing how these concepts um, play out. And the, the second, uh, is in the more kind of uh, aesthetico cultural uh, literary area and, and just staying with the social for a moment and and the 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 arena of of community interpreting which you know you you you, you discuss um i mean is what drew you to community in in, in interpreting the sense that uh, in any community interpreting setting um there are so many different codes uh, at, 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 at play. I mean, I, I just saw a film here in Dublin last night called uh, Aisha, which is a, made by uh, a young Irish filmmaker called Frank Berry. And it's about people, asylum seekers in our direct uh, provision uh, system. But there's a, there's a scene where the um, immigration uh, solicitor is, is sort of coaching um, the asylum for the the interview saying expect this type of question and but but what's interesting is it's not just kind of linguistic coaching you know tell them your story and and and, and tell it in this particular way um, but it's also a kind of um, it's the language of embodiment you know make sure that you look them in the eyes when you mm -hmm. say this uh, don't suddenly jerk your 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 head away so the truth regimes. In the asylum seeking process, there's all these kind of <laughs> the semiotic coding that's going on. Absolutely. So is is this the what was attracting you in the in, in, or looking at the data that was coming from community interpreting interactions? Look, probably both, Michael. I mean, and you're right; it's incredibly rich. But I, I realized the other day the first academic paper I published in 1987 was about a you know mediating a letter from the from the what was the DHSS in those days about benefits to a Moroccan family I was working with. So it's kind of been a very constant theme with me. Um, it, and and it, it was very, very pervasive in our project. Um, but I think there is, it's interesting, the, talking about the aesthetic in relationship to the sort of the socio, as, as you did, I found there was a kind of, a sort of almost like a, a, a sort of, a bleeding back into the social of the aesthetic 
like with the, the, the issues that TK was raising, and we talk about this in the, I think either the introduction or the conclusion, it's almost like you go, if you go to a gallery and you see a particular kind of artwork, it sort of influences the way you see, you walk out of the gallery and you're seeing things influenced by that. And I think our installations of the sort that TK was introducing us to influence the ways of seeing. So I began to see the, the interpreter, the interpret or the, the lawyer work, working with a client and using Google Translate as a, as a means of communicating. I began to see it as being like an installation in a way I hadn't before. So I think that the two have a huge potential for, for, for connecting. And I must say that, I uh, must add that Mike came up this, with this point in retrospect because we wrote the introduction at the, at the very end. So we were actually in the, in the course of writing the book. At one point, I was not comfortable with the divide between part one and part two because we were dealing with the methodologies, um, different methodologies and different, very radically different kinds of data. But this inevitable because Mike and I were, are from different academic backgrounds. So I, we let it be, you know, it's just, just part, part one, part two, you know. So, but then when writing the introduction, when brainstorming ideas in the dialogic introduction, Mike came up with this, um, with what he said just now about this bleeding back, which I found quite, quite interesting. It, it was it really, it was only illuminating at the very end. Oh, that, that could be an underlying um, connection, which we didn't see when while we were while we were writing it, so I so this is a learning process for us as well. So something has been successful because TK is now making a big sort of impact now in multilingualism, and I'm kind of trying to get into translation. So something worked. <laughs> in fact, um, uh, TK Mike mentions you know the impact that you're having on on on, on multilingualism, and then the your this. Um, new book choreographies of, of multilingualism you're looking at kind of linguistic landscapes of of, of, of Singapore and how it's the um, is it you know where there's there's kind of multimodalities there's this multimedia that 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 language is is nested in all of these uh, different um, things is is that is that something that you kind of it was through working with Mike uh, on this book that you began to realize just um, how nested all these things were in um, in in people's everyday lives, you know. I, I think. Yes, in particular, the second part of the book, which is about um, bottom up bottom up multilingualism in Singapore, and that part of the book, my thinking that went into that part of the book, is um, heavily influenced by Annie Cook and other social linguists who are who were dealing with bottom up multilingualism so yes my 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 work in this area including my work with mike in this for this book uh, has influenced my work my other work yes and, and you know looking at, at 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 lines that go out of the book into into other uh, areas I, I said in the introduction mike that you have now become very active in in the field of of, of literary uh, translation, um, and that one of the ways that you're kind of thinking about your translation practice is through this notion of a kind of a an agencement uh, theory of 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 translation. I mean, would, would you like to say a word or two about that, and whether you know what possible connections that there might be with the, the framing of of translation and translanguaging? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I mean, I see, I, I do think this idea of agencement, which is from Deleuze and Guattari, and is typically used in English as assemblage. And the problem I have with assemblage is assemblage is the thing, whereas agencement is the, the thing, but also the process. So it's the kind of pulling together, the bringing together of the available resources in the activity of translation, which, I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm working with another Kurdish poet, um, or a translator rather, Jia Homa at the moment. And we're looking at him, he, he, I don't speak Kurdish, but he's, I've got, he's got texts in Kurdish and also translated into Spanish. And we're working on a Google Docs. And yesterday, 
I was literally sitting with this Google Doc and he was working on the, on the, 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 the text and I was working on the text. And it was, it was just amazing. And I was thinking if I was into researching translation, which I'm not, I just, I'm more interested in doing it. That would be incredible data because you're looking at the, the visibility of the process. The, the process is being made visible. Whereas in the classic translator, sort of the single translator, it's all in the translator's head and it's more difficult to pull out. Although we did talk about, um, uh, what's the term? Think aloud protocol. Think aloud protocol, didn't we? Yeah. So you can do it. But if you get a group translation or people, more than one person collaborating, you then get a kind of, you visibilize the internal processes in a, a way which I think is very interesting. Because that does seem to be a very important um, argument in the translanguaging book is this notion of the kind of, the externalization of translation moments. I mean, that that it's it's seeing, I mean, uh, and also I, I use the, the term affordances and, and, and affordances is very much a term I, I tend to associate with, with those things in your environment that allow you to do this mm -hmm. thing or to prevent you from, from doing yeah. the, 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 the other thing. Um, but also the materiality of particular communicative resource and other resources, the affordance is literally what, what it lets you do sort of thing. Yeah. Um, TK, would you see that that notion of, we say, the externalization of, of translation activity, the, 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 the notion of affordances, that, it, that it's not, not only present in the translanguaging uh, book, but th that also um, scholars like uh, another scholar that's published in this series, uh, Sherry Simon, her cities of translation, sites of translation, you think that there's a kind of a move in, in, in translation studies to, to, to to think more about, you know, what it is, you know, outside the 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 the, 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 the translator that's that, that's part of the the collaborative process. I think certainly there has been um, there has been this development for some years since um, maybe since Sherry Simon's twenty fourteen book. But um, what I see from what you just described now about the externalization of translation moments is that um, translation happens not necessarily as a discrete event, as a very neat event from beginning to end. It could happen in fragments. That's what I learned from the first part of the book, which is based on the AHRC project, which I found very interesting and which, um, Honestly, I'm not, I'm not familiar with this kind of ethnographic data. So this is a learning process for me. And I found that translation is really weaved into a nexus, a broader nexus of discursive practices. So it, it, it exists, it's there, but it's not there alone. And it's also not there coherently from beginning to end. It gets mixed up with all other kinds of practices, discursive practices that um so these different practices really they interweave and interplay with each other and that's how that's where the notion of translanguaging can help us make sense of what is going on in from the uh, more holistic perspective yeah well i suppose that's as well where the that notion of of of, of repertoire is just such a, an important concept because it allows people to um it allows for the the discontinuities that it's it's the mm. the discontinuity that they they sort of coexist and, and and maybe as well I mean and this is echoing maybe uh, another contribution which is ar around that notion of, of play you know that, that what we do we, we kind of play a repertoire you know like we, we do in our daily lives you know we, we, when we do sort of the various accents that we use to to communicate within our language with different people and how this keeps shifting all the time and 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 sometimes we use in a, in a highly ludic mode and, and other times in a less uh, playful but there is that, that 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 sense of before i i uh, ask uh, 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 another uh, question um to do with with translation translanguaging i just want to um invite um our uh, anybody who's uh, watching us or, or listening in uh, to our conversation to uh, please uh, put your questions in the, uh, the, the chat box because there's so many issues that have been raised here and uh, we'd love to, to have your, your questions. 
Um, and I suppose my next question really, it sort of picks up on something that you mentioned, Mike, about um, working on Google Docs and the, uh, the sense of, you were just fascinated by that process itself and the nature of the, of, of, of the process. And I'm just thinking, think of, of you know, the, the section of, of the, the book on, 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 on cyber uh, poetics. Um, and what um, Deleuze and, and Guattari, who were kind of, you know, cited at the, at the beginning of the, 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 the book, and what they say about, you know, machinic ecologies. I mean, is there a sense in, in that one of the ways in which you understand the material um, in, the, in the book is, 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 the, is the material as uh, realized by our virtual technologies i mean is it, right were, were you partly trying to kind of reimagine you know machine translation i'm not saying machine translation as, as you know a technical science that produces but but machine translation thinking about translation and the machine from a translation or translanguaging perspective is that a fair comment i think that 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 is part of it mm -hmm. um for the cyber poetics um, chapter, my thematic concern was more in like how translation is not it's 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 being inco incorporated or subsumed into the text itself, into the creative process itself. So that so such that the creative the writing process, in this case. A virtual writing process becomes um, becomes translational, and because it is cyber poetics technology, digital technology comes in, which complicates the picture um, even more. So there's the intersection between translation, between creative writing, and between um, technology and how. So John Cayley's work really exemplifies this kind of um, very complex interplay between. The different elements and here very often in his works translation becomes a motif and it becomes something that is on a meta level so it's not really about it's not an act anymore it's not an it's not a discursive act anymore between um one language and another it's become a motif that is part of the meaning of the text right um we have a uh, number of questions here. Um, there's a question from uh, Rania Rafat. Um, I'm wondering how the translator can deal with sociolinguistic challenges uh, such as uh, identity. Well, that's a very large <laughs> question. Um, but um, I, I suppose how in terms of the translanguaging paradigm, how it feeds into uh, to translation. What is the impact on, on, on how we think about the questions of, of, of identity? Or do we think about them differently? Mike, can you go first? I'm, I'm gonna have to think about that. That's a very interesting question. I mean, um, I think if you're gonna be engaging in collaborative translation, particularly if you're working with the author, which I, I do often these days, which is fascinating with the poet, then, then, then certain things that seem sort of crystallized in a poem are suddenly up for grabs. You know, it's, it's that sort of things are not quite as, as locked down as it would be if you're simply working with a, a page in a book. So, so, so the collaborative approach kind of throws the ident different identities of the translator and the poet up in the air in a way which I, I love it. it's very quite frustrating sometimes because you know as a translator you have free if you're just working on the page you can do what you like but if you just if the if the poet is there saying well actually no so so it's an interesting tension but yeah great i think the notion of identity has is not foreign to translation studies so for example in the context of um translation as part of activism the translator intervenes very strongly in the translation process and thereby um, projecting a particular stance, for instance. So that, that is part of how the translator deals, deals with or intervenes with um, identity politics. Um, 
A question from Roger uh, Almedo uh, Epinu. Uh, one of the possible approaches to translation is to take into account all the decisions that translator has to make contingent on a given choice, influenced by previous knowledge, acquired habits, etc., and hence to trace the order of precedence for the solving of different problems and the resulting degree of importance of various elements in their work when considered from this viewpoint. Since we are authorized to treat the process of translating in terms of decision problems that are constantly solved, because the simple fact that this conforms with practical experience, it normally brings us to an awareness of translations as an individual uh, activity, the, the Levy's view. What would it be possible to see translanguaging as move away from this ascertaining of the individual key importance of translators into an effective mixture of several collective endeavors that bring us to the notion of uh, communally uh, shared knowledge. So um, in, in, in effect, I suppose, and this seems to be kind of maybe echoing the, the, the last point that was made by Tika, is the question is, you know, to what extent this is moving us away from the individual kind of organicist romantic conception of the you know, capital or of the ultimate translator into, into something that's much more uh, open-ended, um, much more kind of uh, maybe rhizomic, <laughs> to use kind of uh, Deleuzian uh, vocabularies. Is that is that a fair point? That that's what translanguaging is is suggesting. What I was getting from Georges's point, in order to do this, and in order to take account of all the possible versions, you would have to have an account of all the possible versions, and that is something I'm. Sorry to go on about Google Docs, but you, you can actually look back on previous versions. And I was at one point, I was actually taking video, short, you know, small videos of the of the work going on because so you could actually see the process and unpick it and get all of get all of this kind of totality that George uh, refers to. Um, I think opening up translation away from the individual translator struggling with the page. Which is the sort of the image of it, isn't it? People, mm. oh, how difficult! How could you possibly translate a poem? Um, it's a version. You have a version of the poem which emerges from the translation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I think plurality is, is the way to go. Um, there is a question here from uh, Dubrovna. Uh, Pro, um, Thank you so much for this very interesting conversation, a great book. I want to ask about translanguaging intersemiotic translation. At some point in your book, you write that translanguaging is much more dynamic than translation. Uh, Vidal and Campbell suggested the view of translation as static is heavily influenced by Jacobson's focus on output. Today, to an extent the book, you emphasize translation as process. Does this influence your view of this difference between translanguaging and translation? So, Translanguaging maybe is emphasizing more the dynamic and the processual, whereas translation is seen more in terms of uh, product oriented uh, studies. Is that how would you um, respond to? Would you, would you agree that that's why you wanted to bring the translanguaging into translation was to kind of to bring back the processual, the dynamic, the, the, the interactional? So Certainly one of the key attributes of translanguaging is the ING form, as we as we mentioned at one point in the book, translation can be process or product, right? So you can you can say one translation, two translations, but there's no such thing as one translanguage, two translanguages. So um this idea of the processual um processual nature of translanguaging. We want to bring it into translation. As we said, as I said just now, we conceptualize translation and translanguaging as two different axes. So there is still the convention, the conventional idea of translation still works. The A to B trajectory still works, but with between we are we are teasing out the details between the what is transpiring between point A and point B. It's not a linear process, but you know, but lots of punctuated moments and um, each moment is a process so that's how we how that's how we moderate uh the processual nature of translanguaging and the conventional definition of translation mm -hmm. um we 
I have a question here from Trish from Bowden. Thanks very much for your very interesting reflections on how the body expresses or is engaged in translation and translanguaging. In terms of how communicative moments are embodied, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on how embodied experiences or manifestations of translation and or translanguaging perhaps differ from the embodiments of, mo of monolingualism. So. I, I mean, I, I would say that the, it's not really so mono bilingualism. It's the, 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 the embodied is another mode as it were. So it's really the relationship between language and the body is more generally, I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a kind of interesting difference. I could be wrong between that, the sort of the bilingual and not bilingual. There was some fascinating data. I'm, I don't know if anybody else is watching the World Cup. The German team took, you know, they, they did this gesture of mm. in their mouths, yeah? Um, and in the statement, one of them said, denying us an armband is the same as denying us a voice. So really what they were saying was wearing the armband is speak is a form of speaking. And that's what that's what I find incredibly productive in working on the on the data. And it, it is an idea which derives from Judith Butler. But once you start seeing it, as with all theory, you see it everywhere, you know, that, that basically this is a sort of speaking through gesture, but not just gesture through the body, which it, and that that's what I think. And that's another modality. Mm -hmm in relationship to to language i think that it's interesting what do you perhaps, reckon? We, perhaps we also need to reconsider what embodiments of monolingualism mean because i think in social linguistics it's a com commonplace that there is no such thing as pure monolingualism as yeah. such even yeah, within that's the, that's the answer. even within what we call a monolingual um individual they have different registers different different discourses coming together yeah so so that that's um another point to think about yeah so the, the sense in which we uh yeah one, one body contains so many bodies um yeah. okay. so um on this question of the, the 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 plurality of 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 bodies um i'm afraid uh we're going to have to bring our very very interesting a conversation with the, 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 the three bodies here to uh, to to a conclusion. Um, but I think you know, speaking on on, on behalf of um, all the people who've uh, uh, joined us uh, today uh, to listen and to to, to watch, um, how uh, fascinating this conversation and, and your insights have have been, and they 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 just articulate, I think, the sense of the excitement that's contained. Uh, within the book itself and what is particularly gratifying is that, that both of you in, in different ways are prolonging and expressing um, the critical and uh, cognitive and aesthetic and reflective uh, energies uh, of the, 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 the book itself. Um, so for that uh, we are uh, extremely uh, grateful. I would also like to thank you um, all um, for uh, being uh, with us uh, today. Uh, it really has. Uh, it's 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 great to see uh, just how many people uh, turn out uh, for these um, the, the, these seminars, these conversations, uh, and we we, we really are uh, very grateful uh, to you.